So allow me to officially welcome um, everybody who's joined us this afternoon and to thank you for taking the time. My name is Elena Maizel, and I'm the executive director of the Israel Law and Liberty Forum, which is hosting this event. Um, I will shortly have the privilege of introducing our two guest uh, speakers, our guest host and our guest speaker. But first, I'll say a few more words about the forum. We are an Israeli educational initiative modeled on the Federalist Society. We take no policy positions, but are dedicated to enriching Israel's legal discourse and leadership with an emphasis on offering various platforms for discussion and debate on critical issues in Israel's still formative law and governance. We support student chapters at Israel's top law faculties, public events, publications, and podcasts, including uh, on the publication side, I should say, the first ever Hebrew language collection of writings by Justice Antonin Scalia, with the guidance of Mr. Ed Whelan, who is on this call with us today. Thank you. Given the scope and the intensity of the Israeli constitutional debate over the past year, we believe that the mission of cultivating thoughtful and in-depth legal discourse is part of securing Israel's safety and prosperity. On that note, since October 7th, which is one of the darkest days in Israeli history and in Jewish history, we've also dedicated ourselves to promoting scholarship and events on Israel's just war of self-defense, accurate understandings of international law, and legal alternatives necessary to protect Jewish communities under threat abroad. I invite you to be in touch with me personally if you'd like to learn more, and we'll now turn to our event today and to our guests. Israel's Supreme Court recently handed down two controversial decisions which under normal circumstances would have inspired a great deal of debate. Given the importance of the decisions and the likelihood of their reemergence uh, as major factors in Israel's legal and political landscape, we believe that elevating reasoned analysis of the cases soon after the decision and apart from any political fracas is especially important. And in this event, you're going to learn about some of the key differences between the American and Israeli legal systems, the history of the Israeli court's development, and of course, about the substance and the significance of the two recent cases dealing with basic laws legislated over the past year. Effectively constitutional legislation, which the court chose to invalidate in one decision and to defer in another. To that end, let me finally introduce our guests. Note that they'll be speaking for about 40 minutes, give or take, and then we're going to open the event to questions. Please send any questions that you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll first introduce uh, Mr. Whelan. Ed Whelan holds the Antonin Scalia Chair in Constitutional Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. As a contributor to National Review Online's Bench Memos blog, Excuse me. Mr. Whelan has been a leading commentator on nominations to the Supreme Court and lower courts and on issues of constitutional law. He is a lawyer and a former clerk to Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia and has served in positions of responsibility in all three branches of the federal government. He is a co-editor of three volumes of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia's work. Dr. Ben Shemesh, Yaakov Ben Shemesh, received his PhD in political philosophy from the University of North Carolina. In addition, he holds a Bachelor of Law degree from the Hebrew University Jerusalem. He served as legal assistant to Supreme Court President Professor Aaron Barak until the justice's retirement in late 2006. Dr. Ben Shemesh is a senior public law lecturer in constitutional and administrative law at Ono Academic College and regularly appears as a legal commentator on television and radio channels. With his consent, I will also note that Dr. Ben Shemesh is what might be considered a centrist in Israeli legal terms and a liberal on the Israeli political scale, something that he will be able to better elaborate on in conversation. And with that, let's get to the conversation. Please commence. Uh, thank you, Alana. Uh, thank you, Yaakov. Um, very uh, interested in having this discussion. I'm grateful for the audience we have. As Alana mentioned, there's been an intense controversy over the past year in Israel over the new government's ambitious proposals to reform the Israeli legal system and to rein in its Supreme Court. In July, the Knesset enacted uh, a much more modest law, much more modest than the ambitious proposals, that is, that limits the ability of the, of the Supreme Court to declare government actions unreasonable. On January 1st, just a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court ruled that law invalid uh, by a vote of eight to seven. 
Two days later, the Supreme Court ruled by a six to five vote uh, that a law enacted in March that protected the prime minister from being removed from office on grounds of being incapacitated couldn't go into effect until the next session of the Knesset. Yaakov, let's start off by jumping into the matter of reasonableness. In the American system, reasonableness is a concept that signals that judges are inclined to defer to the political processes. Rational basis re review, for example, is the most deferential standard of review under the Equal Protection Clause. It's often said not to have any bite. But I gather that the reasonableness doctrine that the Israeli Supreme Court has developed is, is quite a different animal, so to speak, one with very sharp teeth and a ravenous appetite. Um, yes, well, thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Elana, for inviting me and for the opportunity to speak about these important cases in English this time. I already had the opportunity uh, of commenting um, on these cases in Hebrew on several occasions. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The Israeli type of the reasonableness doctrine is a different kind of animal, uh, and it is much wilder. Um, it is basically a, a legal tool that allows the Supreme Court, not only the Supreme Court, but mainly the Supreme Court, to exercise extremely broad judicial review um, of government actions and more, and more generally speaking of administrative decisions. Um, and uh, what's reasonable and what's unreasonable is a matter of evaluating the competing interests that are involved in a case. That's the broad definition. Uh, I, I would be happy to say uh, uh, there is a much more detailed explanation to come later on. There isn't. That's the reasonableness, the, the right kind of evaluation of interests, which sounds very subjective, very amorphous amorphous, very dependent on the person you're asking. And that's the whole point. The reasonableness doctrine transfers the power of decision from the democratic institutions, government agencies, government, government ministers, the prime minister to the courts. Now, if, you, if we remind ourselves that this doctrine was expanded uh, and, and um, at around, around the same time, were other important um, developments in Israeli constitutional law occurred. That's, I'm talking about the late 1980s and the early 1990s. Uh, for example, I will mention two other changes that happened around the same time that the reasonable, reasonableness, reasonableness doctrine was expanded. One is dropping the requirement of standing. Anyone can petition the Supreme Court for just about anything. That happened in the late 1980s. Um, eliminating the, the doctrine of justiciability. There used to be a perception or a, a, a rule saying that certain things that are political of nature or certain things that uh, concern sensitive matters of public policy are not suitable for judicial review and judicial decision. That doctrine was abolished basically at this around the same time. This is all, of course, uh, 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 um, um, an, an entire revolution. We can call it a, the judicial activism revolution of the 1990s, championed by the Chief Justice Aharon Barak, but not only. And it will be maybe interesting to talk about it a little bit later, why it happened in the 1980s and the 1990s. Of course, the, trans the transfer of power occurred around the same time that the democ democratic institutions changed their nature, became more right-wing, more religious, more Jewish, and the uh, left-wing liberal elite found an alternative way of, of controlling and retaining power. But let's, let me go back to the reasonableness doctrine. So you can see that if you use reasonableness, there is no requirement of standing, there is no um, constraints of justiciability. There is nothing, no decision, small or big, and no decision maker, it might be the prime minister or the chief of staff in the army, that is exempt from the judicial, judicial review of reasonableness. And this, Anything, goes straight, this goes straight to the Israeli Supreme Court. Straight to the, the, the Israeli Supreme Court serves as the high court of justice, and it hears cases um, as the first instance 
Let me give you three or four short examples of the kind of things that the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court discussed under the reasonableness doctrine the past three or four years. I will start with one example. Prime Minister Netanyahu was three years ago was, uh, was charged um, at the criminal court on several accounts of criminal charges. Um, and then he decided to um, hold the new elections that was in uh, 2020. And he won the elections. And he, when he was uh, charged with the responsibility of forming the government, a petition was filed asking the Supreme Court to decide to declare that someone who's facing charges cannot become a prime minister. Now, the, the law on this matter is extremely clear. Basic law, the government says that if someone is convicted of a certain crime, then he cannot be a prime minister. It doesn't say anything about being charged. It says something about convicted. Netanyahu was not convicted. And at the pace things are going right now at the Jerusalem District Court, this will take much longer. So why is the Supreme Court even deliberating the case? Because the question they have to decide is whether it is reasonable or not for someone who uh, is charged uh, with criminal charges to be a prime minister. No basis in law against the outcome, very clear outcome of the elections. 11 judges sit there and this have to decide whether it's reasonable for the Israeli public to decide who is going to be their prime minister. Uh, I was going to say it's unthinkable in, in the US, but now I see it is thinkable. You do have a court saying that someone cannot be a president. Um, but, but, you know, there is a difference. I don't, I, I read the Supreme Court, the Colorado Supreme Court, they didn't say it was unreasonable to elect the Donald Trump. They said, you know, there, there is a clause in the constitution that says that he is not qualified. At least they have some textual basis for, for the decision. Here, it's simply reasonableness, which is quite shocking. Now, one more thing, I, I didn't vote for Netanyahu. Uh, I'm not a supporter of the Likud party, but for me, it's just shocking that this kind of question is decided in the Supreme Court. Uh, Yaakov, before we go back and take a deeper historical look at, at how the Supreme Court has um, acquired its power, could you just um, describe briefly the law that was enacted uh, in July of this year and then um, briefly what the court did with that? Well, we can get to that in greater length uh, later, I think. So the reasonableness doctrine was uh, under heavy criticism from mainly from the political branches, I must say, not enough from academic circles. That's another point we will have to discuss maybe some other day, why the academic uh, uh, circles in Israel were so supportive of judicial activism, but that's a, that's a different topic. And, and this, the current, not the current government, the previous government that was in power until the war erupted three months ago, decided to uh, um, push forward a whole reform in the judicial system. It contained several components, but eventually they only managed to pass one small amendment. Um, it was an amendment to basic law, the judiciary, and it simply said the court will not be able to um, pass judicial review based on reasonableness on decisions that are taken by the government itself or by the ministers of the government. So that was the amendment. It was to restrict the ability of the Supreme Court to use the reasonableness doctrine with respect to certain kinds of decisions. I think the amendment was too sweet. I think they should have, they could have, and they should have tailored it more narrowly so that only decisions of the government and the ministers that are of political nature I would use some kind of justiciability here together with it, but never mind. That's that's the amendment they passed, and it was enacted inside a basic law. Never before the Israeli Supreme Court uh, struck down an amendment in a basic law, and uh, maybe it's maybe it's the right time for me to explain a little bit about basic laws or. Uh, well, sure. Well, let's go back to the deeper historical picture, I think. I was joking with you before that you're a professor of constitutional law in a system that doesn't have a constitution. Uh, you know, in the United States, we had our Declaration of Independence in 1776, and then our miracle at Philadelphia, the promulgation of our constitution in 1787. 
Israel had its Declaration of Independence in 1948, but there was never a miracle at Tel Aviv. The effort in 1949 to establish a constitution for Israel did not succeed. Could you explain what happened next and how these basic laws um, arose uh, in lieu of a constitution? Yes, well, interestingly enough, Israel never drafted, the, never adopted the constitution, but we received the constitution quite surprisingly in one day in 1995. And our constitution was uh, the product of a judicial decision. It was the Supreme Court who decided in 1995 that we do have a constitution. But let me explain a little more in detail. In 1949, a constitutional assembly of 120 members was elected, charged with the responsibility of drafting a constitution. Those 120 people assembled together and they decided that they will not write the constitution. Uh, and they didn't uh, just go home, they decided to call themselves the Knesset. And that's how the first Knesset came into being. We never elected the Knesset. We, we elected the Constitutional Assembly. And the Knesset decided that they're not going to, to write a constitution. But then they added one more thing that was in 1950. They said that instead of a constitution, they will enact basic laws Every few years, they will enact a basic law. Each basic law will address one issue that the constitution is supposed to address. So first we will have a basic law that uh, deals with the uh, parliament, and then we'll have a basic law that will deal with the government, and then we'll have a basic law that deals with the Supreme Court, etc. And eventually when all the basic laws together will be finished, we'll come together and we'll assemble them together and this will be our constitution. So that so these, was the were, these, these basic laws were all enacted by, by simple majority, as I understand it. Often there was with... no requirement, no special procedure, no referendum, no just, just like a simple legislation, no special majority. You can have a basic law enacted three to two votes in the Knesset. And most of our basic laws were enacted more or less like regular laws. They were just titled basic law. That was the difference. And... When I studied constitutional law, I'm old enough to have studied constitutional law before we received our constitution. I studied constitutional law in 1991. And there was, it was clear to all of us that we have no constitution. There is no constitution. And, and it was also clear that because we had no constitution, there was no judicial review over parliament legislation. That was an axiom of Israeli constitutional law when I studied Israeli Israel constitutional law, because <clears throat> there was no basis for judicial review. The par parliament was the supreme sovereign. Whatever it enacted, that was the law of the land. Then came the Supreme Court decision of 1995, Banka Mizrahi versus Migdal, um, in which the Supreme Court decided uh, based on an important development in 1992. In 1992, two new basic laws were enacted. Basic law, human dignity, and basic law, freedom of occupation. Uh, and the Supreme Court decided that these basic laws are actually our constitution. And they are effective as constitution once they are enacted. We don't have to wait until the project is complete. Who knows when? They are already our constitution. And the reason they did that was that it was important for the Supreme Court for the first time to acquire the power of judicial, judicial review over regular legislation. 1995, the constitutional revolution was the claim that regular Knesset legislation that contradicts basic laws can be um, in, struck down by the Supreme Court because regular legislation, just like in the US, that's one thing that now is like the US, if the Congress enacts a law that uh, it, uh, in some way is inconsistent with the constitution, the Supreme Court will uh, strike it down. And that was the decision in 1995. So, so the these basic laws, these, these basic laws were understood <coughs> by the Knesset that enacted them as essentially 
first drafts uh, of a constitution, things that could be revisited. And then, as I understand it, your, your court said in 1995, we are, we are going to treat these as a constitution so that you, uh, uh, Knesset, do not have... Exactly. Do not have, did, did, did the court say then or later that the, that the Knesset doesn't even have the freedom to revise or modify these basic laws by the same simple majority vote by which they enacted them? Well, that, that rule was not changed, not even today. The Knesset is still free because this is not something that is, even our Supreme Court cannot do that. The Knesset is free to revise basic laws. The Knesset is free to abolish basic laws. The Knesset is free to enact new basic laws. What they did in 1995 was to elevate basic laws to the level of a constitution, just to allow the court power of judicial review of a regular legislation. And it was completely clear, and it was clearly said so, in the Supreme Court decisions, that the judicial review of a legislation is based on the status of basic laws as a constitution. Nobody even imagined the possibility of uh, one day that will come that the Supreme Court will acquire, who knows where from, the power to, of judicial review over the basic laws themselves. And that was the dramatic thing three weeks ago. That was the next constitutional revolution, that even basic laws are not, and, and that's a whole shift in the, in the entire hierarchy of norms and the hierarchy of institutions. Until last December, uh, the, the basic laws were, were, were the highest law of the land, and now the Supreme Court is the highest law of the land. So when you said uh, a little while ago that the Knesset can enact new basic laws and modify basic laws, that now, according to the Israeli Supreme Court, is subject to the court's approval of those uh, revisions or new basic laws as consistent with what the court understands the old basic laws to mean or with, uh, with how, how it's interpreted them. Exactly. You know what The new thing is that these basic laws themselves are subject to the requirements. That, well, the Supreme Court is saying something along the following lines. Uh, Israel has some fundamental values, really, really basic values. Israel is a democracy, and Israel is a Jewish state. And these are axiomatic. No one can change it. And if a basic law fundamentally harms and threatens one of these fundamental values, either the Israel being a democracy or Israel being a Jewish state, then uh, the Knesset is abusing the power or overstepping the power of basic laws themselves. And the Supreme Court is the guardian of those fundamental values. And if the Supreme Court thinks that a certain basic law violates the most basic principles of a democratic country, the Supreme Court has the power to strike it down. Well, let me ask about uh, this uh, reasonableness review and how this fits with the treatment of basic laws as, as the constitution. I guess my question, first of all, is, uh, I think I know the answer to this one. Did the, did the Knesset ever enact a statute that authorized the Supreme Court to strike down government actions on the grounds that they're um, unreasonable? Never. The reasonableness, the reasonableness doctrine is a product of the Supreme Court decisions. The Supreme Court created this doctrine and created this power for itself. Uh, Does that develop independently of the treatment of, of basic laws as the constitution or was it part and parcel? Around the same time, at around the same time, it was in the mid 1990s, the first time that the Supreme Court decided that the basic laws are our constitution and the first time that the Supreme Court prevented Prime Minister Rabin from appointing Arya Deri the leader of Shas back then in 1993, he appointed him to be a minister in his government. And the Supreme Court said it was unreasonable for someone who was charged uh, with, with crimes of bribery to be a minister. And it was the first important case in which the Supreme Court uh, um, uh, told the prime minister, you, you, you don't, you're not allowed to decide who's going to be on your government and who's not. So it is, it's around the same time. And I have 
you know, it's it's not accidental that it's around the same time. Uh, this whole package of activism, as I mentioned earlier, it was a reaction to the change in Israeli politics. The more power moved from the left-wing parties to the right-wing parties, the more, you know, since 1977 until now, it's been almost 50 years, um, I don't have the exact count, but I would estimate maybe 40 years out of these 50, it's, it's a right-wing government. Nachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir and uh, Ariel Sharon and Olmert and Netanyahu, of course, has been elected prime minister who knows how many times. And that's the way for the, the left to hold and retain uh, control that they cannot get this kind of power in the political realm because they're diminishing for various reasons. That's why they need the power at the academia, they need the power at the Supreme Court. That's the way of um, um, keeping their power and keeping their influence on Israeli society. Even though the, the, the people, the public is moving away, um, they cannot get enough votes in the Knesset, but they can get enough justices, the Supreme Court, and that's good enough, it turns out. You, you don't have to get enough votes in the parliament if you have eight justices on your side at the Supreme Court. That's the trade-off. Yeah, well, let's, let's uh, turn to this this past year. And there are some issues that are beyond the core of what we're discussing here that were part of the reform efforts. Uh, I think um, limitations on the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, uh, limitations on uh, justiciability, limitations on the extraordinary power that a civil servant in your system called the attorney general ha has, um, reforms to how the members of the Israeli Supreme Court are selected. I gather you've sort of had a self-perpetuating system. But let's get to, let's get to, uh, to, to the reasonableness um, uh, reform that was enacted in, in, in late July. Now, was this um, law that was enacted then designated by the Knesset as a basic law? It was. It's Section 15D uh, of Basic Law, the Judiciary. Okay. And so, what, what you ha tell us about? I, I guess it's the, the 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 opinion that was issued on on New Year's our New Year's Day is 700 or 800 pages long. Plus, uh, it's in Hebrew. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, very few um, uh, Americans are are able to read. I understand. I don't know. I don't know. You have you have 15 uh, justices on that court. I guess it was the first time that all it the was justices the first time for the full bench. Together. Yeah. And um, so, as I understand, the court divide, divided um, on two separate issues. One, it divided 12 to three, and on the ultimate issue of whether the reasonableness reform should be um, uh, invalidated, um, it divided eight to seven. Could you tell us a little bit about um, uh, the, the, the court's reasoning? Yes, or, well, the first, question, the first question was, does the court in principle have the power to strike down basic laws? So is there at all judicial review over basic laws? On that question, three of the most conservative judges said, no, we do not have this power. 12 of the justices said, we do have this power to strike down amendments to basic laws or entire basic laws. However, um, four of the uh, 12 justices who said we do have the power. Well, all of the justices who said we do have the power, they all agree that they can only use this power of judicial review over basic laws only when in the most extraordinary circumstances, circumstances of serious threat to the Israeli democracy. So four of the justices said, we don't consider this limitation on the reasonableness doctrine. We don't consider this amendment to basic law, the, the judiciary, to be of such significant magnitude to justify the, the use of this nuclear power of, of striking down basic laws. Eight justices, and that's the 8 7 decision at the end of it, right? Eight justices say yes to the first question. We do have the power to strike down basic laws in the most extraordinary circumstances. 
And then he asked the second question, is this the, this rare, extraordinary circumstances? The answer is yes. So it was an eight to seven bottom line, the narrowest, narrowest margin you can imagine for this kind of decision, but it was enough. It's still a majority. And, and to put this in American terms, if, if, if you accept the position of the Israeli Supreme Court that basic laws are the constitution, this is as though the Supreme Court of our country were to strike down a constitutional amendment that had been uh, lawfully ratified and saying exactly. that, 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 that it's not part of the constitution. Exactly. This is striking down constitutional amendments. But again, let me remind you that the circumstances are different. You Americans, you cannot change your constitution unless you go through the Fifth Amendment. It's a very complex procedure. Here, you can do that. You can change a basic law next week. So that I think that's why I think that theoretically speaking, we should say that there could be judicial review over basic laws because basic laws can be enacted. Simple majority, simple procedure, nothing special is required. But only when these basic laws seriously threaten. I, I go with the four justices, by the way, who remained in the minority position, who said, yes, we do have the power, theoretically speaking. No, this is not the case to use it. So I'm, I'm on their side. The reason I'm on their side is, as I said, first, I don't think we should allow the Knesset unrestricted power to enact basic laws, not when you don't need special majority. If you require it, three fourths of parliament, that's, that's something else. But first you have to require it. On the other hand, I'm not going to allow the Supreme Court this free power to eliminate basic laws whenever they think they don't like it. So that's why I think we should have the power. Yes, well, the Supreme Court should have the power, but be just extremely cautious with it and never, I think, never use it by a one vote margin majority. Well, pressing you a bit from the right then, it sounds as though you're accepting um, this revolution in the 80s that treated basic laws as constitutional. And you're sim and you're just urging that uh, that uh, the court be very careful. Uh, it, I, I assume both in how it interprets those basic laws, but also in in, in, uh, in be especially careful if we were to strike down a later basic law as, as being in conflict with those. Um, whether or not I accept it, you know, it's 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 almost like asking, do you accept Marbury versus Madison? You just wa uh, water under the bridge. This is our law. Okay. okay, so I accept it. As a, even as a conservative, I accept it. Uh, that's our settled law. And I even accept the new development that theoretically you could even pass judgment on basic laws. Uh, uh, there are more conservative positions. You know, there, there are the three judges, Justice Solberg, Justice Mintz, Justice Elon, who say, no, the Supreme Court does not have the power to pass judicial review um, over basic laws. Can you tell us briefly about the uh, court's second ruling, the one on July, on uh, January 3rd? Um, the, there, is a, there is a question of when, there, there's a clause in our basic law, the government that says that if the prime minister is incapacitated, then someone else should be re replacing him. There's a procedure for choosing uh, someone else instead of him. And the question was, it was not decided, it was, it was not clear in, in the law itself. W what does it mean that the prime minister is incapacitated? We all kind of understood that it means that, you know, he was severely uh, ill or like Ariel Sharon who, who, who got a stroke. Um, so that's kind of incapacitation. And, that, and that, was, that was the general understanding. Nothing was written in the law. But and recently, very recently, again with Netanyahu and with his criminal charges at the, Supreme, at the district court, the attorney general came up with the idea that if Netanyahu is going to use his office in ways that benefit him, for example, uh, have some kind of effect on the judges or some, something like that, uh, 
then they will be able to say, declare him incapacitated, um, legally incapacitated. This is a new invention, just a weird thing. And then they will be able to remove him. Now, Netanyahu, when he heard of that, not only, we all kind of, most of us were shocked, but Netanyahu just pushed forward an amendment to the basic law of the government. And now it says clearly that incapacitation means physical inability. Just to make clear that the Attorney General cannot do whatever it is that she thought she was able to do. A petition was filed asking the Supreme Court to strike down this amendment. This one on the basis of personality, abuse of power, using the power for your personal benefits. The Supreme Court chose a more modest result and it decided again one vote majority, six to five, and again, clearly on ideological and political lines, the six activist judges against the five center conservative judges, the Supreme Court decided that this amendment will take effect in the next Knesset session. So Netanyahu has to behave uh, because he is still under the threat of being declared incapacitated by the attorney general. The same attorney general, am I right, who brought the criminal charges against him in the first place? No, that was her predecessor. The same position. Okay. The same position. Oh, yeah, of course. The same position. The same position. The same attorney general that was not appointed by this government, and they cannot replace her. Uh, so she was appointed by the previous minister of justice, Idon Sal. Uh, this government is seriously not happy with her. But uh, she cannot be removed. She cannot be replaced. And she's more likely to be elevated to the Supreme Court at some point. Well, that depends on whether or not the, the, the committee members will change, right? That's part of the plans that uh, Yariv Levine, the, the justice minister, is thinking about. Well, in terms of a head of government being incapacitated, it's difficult not to see parallels between what you're talking about in Israel and some things that, that, that might happen or are happening uh, uh, in our country. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the timing of um, these rulings. Uh, okay, you had, again, this very contentious division in uh, Israel over these reforms. Then on October 7th, these horrific attacks that obviously provide cause to unify the nation and put lesser things behind. One might have thought as an outsider that the Israeli Supreme Court would just sit on these matters for a long, long time, but that didn't happen. Could you um, explain why? Well, here is what happened. Uh, first of all, I have to say that the pace that the petition regarding the reasonableness case, the, 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 time, the period it took was record short. Uh, it was, as you mentioned, the law was passed in July. The court heard oral arguments on that case in September, two months after the law was enacted. Usually these kind of cases take a year or two or maybe three. The reason was that uh, in our Supreme Court, unlike, unlike yours, justices have to retire at the age of 70. They have mandatory retirement age. And in October of 2023, two liberal justices uh, retired, President Hayut and Justice Anad Baron. And once you and, and they both wanted to sit and hear and decide this case. Once you hear their arguments, you have and they and they retired in October, they have three months to uh, write the decision. After three months, they cannot write any more decisions. So it was kind of, they had to deliver the decision um, in the middle of the war because it was impossible to wait. Had they waited two more weeks, these two justices will have to be removed from the bench and there will be only 13 remain. And of course the outcome would be reversed. It would be seven um, against six. And they didn't want that to happen. So they had to publish this uh, opinion, this decision during the war. I must say that um, the government reacted in a very moderate way. So 
it, 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 but it will come back, of course. But I think we we over it. It's, it didn't it didn't erupt in any in any um, significant way in the Israeli public uh, or media or something like that. Now you were a law clerk to uh, former Chief Justice Aron Barak, who is um, credited or or blamed, depending on your uh, perspective, um, by virtually everyone as the architect of this um, uh, Israeli Supreme Court. Um, constitutional revolution. I, I have to say, I'm impressed by how candid <laughs> he was about what he was doing. I know some of his writings, you'd almost think that um, someone is is uh, offering a parody of his position, um, but he, he he spells out simply how aggressive he is. Uh, could, you have any observations on that? Uh, I think Justice Barak was well, first of all, you're right. He was very upfront. He, he never, he never uh, tried to manipulate or hide the innovations uh, or the uh, or the extremely activist measures he developed and he used. I think he he was fortunate because uh, you know it it takes time for uh, other um, actors in the public sphere and the political. Uh, sphere to realize what's going on and to react. By the time people realize what happened during his term and how powerful the Supreme Court became, he wasn't there anymore. So he didn't have to face the harsh political, he did have, to, he started facing harsh criticism at the very last two or three years of his, of his tenure. But most of the opposition um, arose and, and intensified a decade later. So I think he was luckier than Hayut. Hayut just got the most fierce government against her with the most uh, ambitious plan of reforming just about everything uh, about the Supreme Court. Bach never had to deal with this kind of political opposition, not because he wasn't doing every, all the things he did, he did, but because it took another 10 or 15 years for the political uh, institutions to realize what was going on and to start reacting. Now, this kind of reaction, of course, failed. We know that the first year of last year, the judicial reform in political terms was a failure, but the opposition will not go away. The criticism will not go away. Any judges on the Supreme Court from now on will have to deal with it sooner or later. Well, let me ask you one, one more question here, then I, I invite questions from our audience, um, please. Um, submit them, I guess, via the Zoom uh, feature. Uh, this is a very difficult question, but where do you see all this headed? I mean, what what um, what do you anticipate happens next? Am I right to think that that um, the, that you know, even though it was a, a you know very conservative government that sought um, these ambitious reforms, that there's concern um, across a broad swath of the um, ideological spectrum in Israel about the um, ill-founded nature of the Supreme Court's power and about its uh, seeming to act without um, uh, any any basis on a whole range of matters. I think these two cases will backfire if you ask me. Um, moderate people realize now what others maybe realized 10 years ago or 15 years ago, that the Supreme Court has gone too far. Um, and this will make it much more difficult for the court to enjoy the support of the public, to enjoy the support even of, of academics like myself and others like, like myself. So I, I think that was the last major activist court decision we're going to see for the next foreseeable few years future. Uh, not only because two justices already retired, and now there is a slight majority of the more uh, uh, moderate conservative seven justices as opposed to six activist justices, but also because I seriously think the Supreme Court is losing credibility. The Supreme Court is losing confidence, public confidence. And I think uh, we are entering a more restrained period, even if no action is taken by the parliament. So uh, I, I'm optimistic in a way. Uh, it, it got as 
as as bad as it could, and now it can only get better. Okay, let me turn to some of the questions we have, and uh, one builds, I think, uh, on what you just said, which is uh, who controls appointments to the Supreme Court. And I know it can be a very convoluted process, but perhaps you could explain. I think it's I think it's been said that the um, existing members of the Supreme Court have a veto over who um, becomes a Supreme Court justice, or at least that the most senior members do. Could you talk outline briefly? What the current system is for appointment to the Supreme Court, and uh, also if you see any reforms likely. Well, there is a committee of nine members who's uh, who's making the appointments to the Supreme Court. Uh, two government ministers, two parliament members, um, two members of the Israeli Bar Association, and three Supreme Court justices: the Supreme, the Chief Justice, and two other justices. So uh, three out of nine. Then we have to add another, another uh, detail. In order to be appointed to the Supreme Court, you need to get seven votes out of the nine members. And that means de facto veto vote, veto power to the Supreme Court justices. If the three justices uh, are not willing to vote for you, you will not be in the Supreme Court, even if they rest of the other six will vote for you because you will, you will not get the seven votes. Now we have to add one more item to this soup, but why would the three justices all vote as one block? Why is it like that? Well, they do. They, uh, they, they, they vote as a block and they always vote on the liberal side until I think, not even now, even now the three most senior justices are three activist justices. Fogelman, Amit, and um, Justice Daphne Barak Erez. There was supposed to be a conservative judge on the committee for the first time, Justice Solberg. But then we would have three men, three justices that are all men, and the law says that if there are three justices, one of them has to be a woman. So they replaced Solberg with Daphne Barak Erez. So we still have three very activist justices on the committee. If they do not vote for you, you will not be appointed. So they have a veto power. Um, I don't think it will change anytime soon. Uh, but you know, the, 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 the political um, members of the committee also have their veto power to uh, uh, cabinet ministers and to parliament members. So there is a, I don't know how do you say it, um, um, balancing of threats and they will have to compromise. They will have to negotiate some kind of a deal. So and eventually they'll probably appoint one conservative judge and one activist judge. And that's an improvement. 50% conservative is a big improvement. Uh, you explained earlier that there is no standing requirement uh, in, in the uh, for matters, uh, complaints filed with the Israeli Supreme Court and that there's broad original jurisdiction as opposed to you know, uh, uh, the appellate jurisdiction, which is the usual um, way that uh, cases reach our Supreme Court. Uh, one question, can a non-Israeli submit a petition to the Israeli Supreme Court? Of course, of course. Okay. Uh, what kind of, uh, how, do, how do you think all the Palestinians uh, reach the Supreme Court? Uh, how do you think there was a student, an American student that was denied visa, entry visa to Israel because she was a BDS activist or something. And she, she, she filed a petition asking the Supreme Court to let her in and they did. Uh, Two months ago, a hospital in Gaza that was ordered to evacuate. Um, Friday night, Shabbat, by, uh, the, the night of Shabbat, a petition to the Supreme Court by, by that hospital in Gaza uh, asking the Supreme Court to uh, stop the evacuation. Of course, non-Israelis can and do uh, petition the court. Well, in your example of the American uh, denied a visa, I mean, there happens to have been arguably standing there and she claimed she was injured, but uh, you, you, that doesn't matter. Your point is anyone, anyone anywhere can file, there's some sort of filing fee. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, oh, I thought you were asking about non-Israelis and that was just an example for, for non-Israeli, but with, with respect to standing, again, anyone can, can uh, petition for anything. For example, if you have a problem with Netanyahu being the prime minister, just go ahead and file a petition. You just just have to pay the fee. Uh, you have a problem with Arya Deri being the 
the interior minister, just go ahead and petition, uh, file a petition and they will re remove him from office. You have a problem with the reasonableness doctrine, go ahead and file a petition. And the Supreme Court is flooded with, they hear 10,000 cases a year. Your Supreme Court hears, I don't know, 60 or 70 or 80 cases a year. Our Supreme Court hears thousands of cases every year. But the, it must simply deny most of these petitions without of any. Of course, ninety-five percent of these petitions are denied. But still, so that might that, be that, that might be closer to the, the court's denial of certiorari. In which case, you you may be getting um, up closer to the ten thousand mark um, in our system. Um, another question um, about basic laws: um, Are there different levels of basic laws? You know, super basic laws and lesser basic laws. And, and what criteria are employed to label a law a basic law? There are no levels of basic laws, but there are basic laws in which they added clauses saying, this basic law cannot be amended unless you have 61 members of the Knesset voting for it, for example. So you have uh, basic laws that have some kind of restrictions on how you can amend them. Uh, now, what counts as basic law? There are no rules because we never decided these issues. It is customary to say and customary to think that you should not enact a basic law unless the subject, subject matter is appropriate for a constitution. For example, unless it deals with the structure of government or unless it deals with protection of, of human rights or unless it deals with uh, the powers of the court but these are only traditional things that happened, but there are no rules about it. There are no uh, formal restrictions on what can be enacted as a basic law and what cannot. Another question here. Um, what are the prospects for Israel settling upon a formal written constitution? Now, <laughs> it seems so deeply divided that it's even hard to uh to form the, the the knesset at times but uh you know do you think there's any any prospect um that um at, where are we uh you know nearly more than 70 years after um israel's founding that that um an actual constitution might get agreed upon and adopted no but but there's no chance but i will tell you what might happen and that's the most optimistic vision we have here in israel that they will adopt basic law legislation, a basic law that um, explicitly says that basic laws require a special procedure and special majority. Once you have that in place, for example, you cannot amend a basic law unless you have 70 parliament members. And you cannot strike down a basic law in the Supreme Court unless you have two thirds of of the justices voting for it. Things like that, two or three things at basic law, the legislation, that will uh, stabilize the situation um, in significant ways. There is no chance for us to have a constitution now. It's too late for that. Um, even the attempt of doing it will cause so much trouble that uh, I. I wouldn't count on it. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit more about this uh, civil servant known as the attorney general in your system. Uh, of course, in our system, uh, the attorney general is nominated by the president, is usually seen as uh, among his most important uh, picks, is confirmed by the Senate, answers to the president, is removable by him, uh, and is, again, very much a part of his uh, administration. Uh, things are very different in your system. Again, we do not have a anything um, like a law that describes the power of the attorney general or the way um, he or she are appointed. This is all was invented as we went along. The situation is that the attorney general is appointed by a committee, again, a committee, uh, not uh, not by the prime minister, um, and they serve. Uh, they each serve terms of six years, and those years uh, they overlap. They can go one or two or three governments 
Um, so uh, one government can inherit uh, the attorney general from the previous government, and it is almost impossible to replace, and they basically are not replaced. So that's one thing. They have six-year terms, regardless of who's in power, and they have to go through the six years. You, you cannot get rid of them. And the other thing is they're very, very powerful and independent because their take on what the law says, their interpretation of the law is binding upon the government, is binding and binding upon the government ministries. Uh, why is that? Because the Supreme Court said so. The Supreme Court said in 1995 that the interpretations and the views of the attorney general are binding upon the government. If the government is wishing to act in a way that is not in accordance with the attorney general, they have to petition the Supreme Court and ask the Supreme Court to let them do something against the wishes of the attorney general. That's how powerful they are. So uh, not only the attorney general, all, all government ministries have legal advisors and the all legal advisor are uh, the uh, all the legal advisors report to the attorney general they're independent and their views and interpretations of the law are binding upon government ministers um so extremely powerful and the attorney general um decides which arguments to make in the supreme court on cases involving the government it's, a, it's a, the attorney general that is that, that is the lawyer in charge of representing the government, even though he or she might be hostile to that same government. This is exactly what happened in those two cases. In both cases, the reasonableness case and the uh, the prime minister's incapacity case, uh, incapacitation case, in both of these cases, the attorney general uh, uh, was hostile to the government. She thought that both laws should be um, abolished, and the government in both cases had to hire, they had to hire private lawyers, they had to ask for permission, and she gave them permission to hire private lawyers to represent their position. So that was kind of, I was, I was, I was at the court that day when the reasonableness case was argued, and I really, I thought to myself, wait a minute, so the, these people are representing the petitioner, this person is representing the prime minister. Who is the attorney general representing? What's, what's her job? I mean, who are you representing? And of course, the answer is I'm representing the public interest. I'm representing the rule of law, uh, but I'm, I don't have to represent the government, present or, or, the, or the minister of justice or anything like that. And I understand that there's also a, a uh ill-defined crime of breach of public trust that the attorney general has broad authority to um, prosecute? Well, these, this is one of the charges that Netanyahu is charged with, uh, breach of trust. Not the only one, though. Um, there, on this one, they, the, the, uh, I think uh, who, the, the Supreme Court already criticized this, uh, this charge as being too vague and uh, actually recommended that uh, the Knesset um, uh, should think about rephrasing this charge. Uh, and the Knesset here is to blame that they still didn't do that, but it is true that it's very vague, breach of charges, but breach of uh, um, uh, confidence. And again, it gives a lot of power to the same public uh, official, the attorney general that can decide um, whether or not to press charges. Yes, absolutely. You referred earlier to the, uh, I guess, the cultural conflict um, within Israeli society, um, often seen as, I think, uh, you know, religious right versus a very secular left. I guess there are, are uh, ethnic components even within that. Um, oh, absolutely. Sephardic versus Ashkenazi uh, uh, Jews. Uh, could you and, and of course, we see. I mean, all these, I don't know how many different political parties are representing the Knesset. Um, but um, could you just again offer some thoughts on how this cultural conflict underlies this debate over the role of the Supreme Court? Well, look at the look at the eight justices 
that were in the majority view to strike down the reasonableness law. Um, eight secular, liberal, Ashkenazi justices. I consider there's one Arab justice there, Justice Kaboub, so he's not Ashkenazi, but he is on the liberal side. Um, and of course, of course, it's, it's, it means something, it says something. Um, the, uh, the Israeli public, I would say over the last 30 years, 35 years, um, is moving more or less, right? There are periods, but as a general trend, they're becoming more right-wing, uh, more Jewish, not necessarily more religious, but, but more Jewish in the terms of either being Masorati or being more people that their Jewish identity means a lot to them and they do care about it. Um, and, and then they look at the Supreme Court and they, they don't really, I, I don't think our Supreme Court should represent the people. I don't think that the Supreme Court should be uh, of the same uh, makeup uh, uh, as the political parties in the Knesset. I do think there is some value in an independent branch. They're not elected, they're not accountable to the public. They are detached. But there is a difference between you know, being detached from the people and being detached from the people and looking at them, I don't, I don't want to say harsh words, but with kind of mm, disrespect, uh, as, as deplorables, one might say. Well, that's that's just well, you, you know, as as uh, we are, we we have better values. We are more advanced. We have universal values. We have cosmopolitan values. We don't hold the same Jewish nationalistic religious stuff that you people believe in, uh, and that's the problem. The problem is not that the Supreme Court. There are a bunch of elitists. There should be elitists. So I am all for elites. Uh, that's. You know, that's the Supreme Court. But, but we used to have justices that were part of the people. They were higher up, fine, but they shared the same values. They were Zionist, they were Jewish, they were nationalist in a good sense. They were not cosmopolitan liberals, let's say. And that's what changed, right? You see that the public is going one direction and the justices they're not going the other direction, but they are remaining at the same place where they were in the 1980s and the 1990s. And, and, I don't, and that's a one other reason why I think this cannot last forever. It cannot be the case that the Supreme Court, which is a very important institution in our culture, will be so detached from the people, so alienated from the people. And that's the problem. When I look at these eight people, I don't mind. You can strike down whatever laws you want. That's fine. That's your job. But when I look at them as a cultural group, then I have to say to myself, you eight justices, you represent maybe 15, 20% of the Israeli population. And the other seven justices, they represent 75, 80% of the Israeli population. And that's not going to work. I'm surprised it worked for so long, but that's not going to work for much longer. And that cultural divide, this will have to change because uh, it's gone way out of balance. Well, I think we've uh, just gone over our, our period. Um, I uh, think we've answered most or all the questions uh, posed here. So Yaakov, if you have anything more to, to add, please do. But uh, I, I thank you for the enlightening discussion. Uh, I feel like I, I'm, I'm ending in a pessimistic note and that's not what I'm feeling. Um, a lot depends of course, on what happens here in terms of the war and in terms of the political system. Um, I do think and I do hope that we will emerge from this very difficult period in our time in Israel uh, stronger, not only in, with respect to the uh, security and military questions, but also with, with respect to our understanding that we can, as a people together, do uh, the required things to amend our constitutional system and amend our Supreme Court. 
the amendments are required. Most people understand it. And I do hope we will find a good way of doing it. Well, as a uh, friend of Israel, I, I, I sh uh, sure hope and pray so. Um, and uh, again, uh, really, uh, 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 I'm very sad for what your country is uh, going through now in the much uh, more existential battle against uh, uh, Hamas. Thank you. Thank you indeed. So I'm going to thank both of our, our, our host and our speaker. Again, I'd like to thank everybody who took time out to join us today. Uh, we're quite honored to provide a platform for this discussion and for other perspectives as well. There's more to come. I would like to stress, um, I think, in the line of what Yaakov uh, or Dr. Ben Shemesh mentioned just now, is that no matter the legal or cultural conflicts that are accompanying this construction process of the Jewish state, including those that were touched on tonight, we do stand shoulder to shoulder, uh, united against the threats that now face us as a country and a people. Our next events will turn back to focus on international law and the law of armed conflict, including an upcoming event on Israel at the International Court of Justice. I hope you enjoyed, learned, and are looking forward to joining us in the future. Be well and good night from Jerusalem. <laughs>